morning, saints. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning this morning. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to be working, uh, uh, reading from 2 Samuel 6. We're going to start at 14. When you get there, let me know. Amen. 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 Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. Said so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael Saul's daughter looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they thought the ark of the Lord and set it in the place that midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offering and the peace of the offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone the loaf of bread, a piece of meat and a cake and raisins. So all the people departed everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless the household and Michael the daughter of uh, Michelle the daughter of Saul came out to meet David and said how glorious was the, the king of Israel Today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servant, as one of the base follows the seamless uncover himself. Mm -hmm. So David said to Michael, I was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of the house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord. So Israel, therefore, I will pay much before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified for this. Will <coughs> and will he humble in my own sight? But as for the maid service of whom you had spoken to me, I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul had no children to the day of her death. I just read for you 2 Samuel 6, uh, verse 14 through 23. Amen. 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 Good morning again. Um, I'll be reading second old scripture to be one of Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verse 1 through 6 and 22. And it reads as follows. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth 
righteousness, and judgment for all that are oppressed. And verse 22, bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. I've read for you Psalm 103, verse 1 through 6 and 22, that those that hear his word, live his word. Amen. 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 At this time, we have a, another worshiping song. The number 10, Oh How I Love Jesus, in the red hymn, number 10. <laughs>
and those that have been in relationships can attest to many a time those words have been spoken and not lived up to. You can't do that with God. You can't play with God. I had a friend this week told me, in fact, it was yesterday. He said, I've been redeemed. Mm -hmm. I looked at him. He said, I've always been a believer. And I said, so you decided to stop playing with God. And he goes, that's right. I live right now what God has instructed me to live. I, I have accepted the Lord and all his commandments. Mm -hmm. And I will live by his commandments. Amen. And I think many of us walk around and mm -hmm. other words, I love Jesus and I love you. But when the time is showing, are you up to the standard? And we have a pastor that will show us the standard that he expects us to uphold that has been given to him from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that our pastor shows us love every day. Our pastor not just shows us love with words, but with acts of kindness, with a smile, with a handshake, with a touch, with a gentle greeting, just asking, how are you doing? And we appreciate your pastor for doing that. Mm -hmm. We thank you. We thank Amen. God for bringing you here. And I ask that you prepare yourselves to receive the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's going to use our pastor to deliver the word to you today that is meant just for you. Not meant for anybody else, but for you. And that's why God has you here today. So please open your hearts, open your minds, and open your spirits and receive our pastor. Stay seated. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, 4 o'clock. Praise the Lord. Oh, come on, y'all. Praise the Lord, 4 o'clock. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We serve an awesome and true God, and I am so thankful and humbled to be in his presence today. Amen. Just to be with you today is just an honor and a privilege. Before I go further, I just want to thank those visitors who came. We appreciate your presence here at 4 o'clock, and we thank you for just join us, joining us in this worship service. God bless you. Amen. So before we get started, I just want to say a hearty good morning. Good morning. morning. Four o'clock Missionary Baptist Church. Greater four o'clock Missionary Baptist Church. I enjoy that greater piece because it lets us know that it's not us that have the greatness, but that it's him. See, you can put Baptist Church, you can put four o'clock, but when you put that greater piece, it takes on a different connotation. See, some people feel like we think we are greater than others, that we are better than some other religious organization or institution. But that's not it at all. It's that we recognize the one who is greater than we are, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That we recognize not the greatness in ourselves, but the greatness in the one in which we serve. We recognize that greater is he that is in me than he that is what? In the world. Amen, amen. We recognize that God is faithful and he is great in his faithfulness to us. Yeah. His greatness is legendary, church. His greatness is renowned and his greatness is greater and bigger than anything we have ever known and anything we will ever know. Mm -hmm. That's why we love him so. Yes. Great is our Lord, great is our God, great is our mm -hmm. King. Yeah. Now, August church is a really unique month, especially in the life of any year, but this year especially, because August starts school, and school restarts, and our mindset gets in the hustle and bustle of the new school year. It opens up new experiences, and it opens up new opportunities for both parents and students. During this time of year, the summer vacations have ended, and the seriousness and effectiveness of focusing on learning becomes paramount. But this particular August is distinctively unique because we have a resurgence of COVID in this area. In Florida, we have the worst rates of infection among the non-vaccinated. The house church is on fire. 
And we have to work together as a society to put that fire out. Amen. So again, I plead with my neighbors to get vaccinated and wear your mask so we can defeat this foreign threat yes. and live yes. the life abundant. Mm -hmm. Also in August, we look from a different vantage point. A vantage point that looks toward and focuses on the holidays. The holidays are on the horizons and we're looking forward to them, but what do we do in this time in between? See, it's my time, it's my opinion, excuse me, that in this time of year, we should go about and become more energized and more prepared to go on this Christian way. See, in this time of year, we can still promote the goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. In this time of year, we can still tell people that Jesus is real and yes, he is soon to come. I thought it fitting that in promoting that, we look at a text that looks at a biblical leader that promoted the goodness of God and worship in his own way. So if you have your Bibles or your devices with you, I'd like for you to look back to the text of 2 Samuel. And at this time, we're going to look at the 6th chapter, but we're going to begin reading at the ninth verse. That's 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. We're going to begin reading at the ninth verse. If you have it, please say, Amen. 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 And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, How shall the Ark of the Covenant come to me? So David would not remove the Ark of the Covenant unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the Ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom all in his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and that pertained unto him, because of the Ark of God. So David went and brought the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom, and into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord, they had gone six paces, and he sacrificed oxen and fatness. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded in the linen and fun. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she was despised him in her heart. It said that Michael saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Now, church, we look at this familiar text that we find in 2 Samuel. We see that we're talking about a person that is well-renowned, and that is King David. But he wasn't always a king. He actually was someone who was on the run for a time, and he was someone that had to go through some things. Now, we look at him in the beginning where he was a young boy. And we're familiar with this great biblical story about him being a young boy who had a slingshot, and he slew a mighty giant by the name of Goliath. See, I love that text. It's not just for children. Because it lets me know that I can slay giants in my life. That giant of depression, that giant of anguish, that giant of financial concern. I can slay that giant as long as I have God on my side. Yeah. Oh, somebody give me an amen. amen. Yeah. So this young boy then grew up to be a young man. And this young man was a thorn in the side of the first king of Israel, Saul. He was a boy that became a young man, but then he also became a little older and created one of the most noteworthy indiscretions in the Bible, where he actually had a man killed because he fathered a child with his wife. See, yes, we are familiar with this man after God's own heart. But in this particular piece of the scripture, we see that David is in the newness of his reign. He's just coming off a civil war. You see, remember I told you, David had to go through some things. Mm -hmm. So before he was anointed king, the remnants of Saul's family actually caused problems for him, and he had to fight a battle with them before he became king. So he was fresh off the hills of that battle, and he wanted to celebrate. And he celebrated mm -hmm. by remo mm -hmm. removing the ark of the Lord into the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, the text we read was actually his second attempt. 
Because we find that David wanted to do this the first time, but things went awry. So the first time we have great King David, and he has a new cart built, and they place this cart on the cart, they place the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, the drivers of the Ark were Uzzah and Ahio. They were the two sons of Abinad. Remember, this is where the Ark had been housed for 20 years. And that house was being blessed over 20 years. And look at the honor that this man's sons had to which was bestowed upon them. They were allowed to bring the ark into the city of Jerusalem. So we have this brand new cart. We have this wonderful ark. We have these two men leading these oxen and going toward Jerusalem. But not only that, you have these musicians. And it said that it was almost an angelic chorus because you had them playing cymbals and harps and string instruments. And I'm pretty sure that everybody was having a good old time. So they walk and they go forth and they hear the music, but then one of the oxen stumble. You know, in animal trips, we all trip and fall. We don't see a root on the ground. And when he trips and stumbles, the ark starts to shift in the cart. So then we have Uzzah reaching forth to catch the ark, and as soon as he touches it, he dies. He hits the ark to try to move it and get it straight on the cart to do something that he thought would have been important because you don't want the Ark of the Covenant to fall on the ground, but as soon as he touches it, he dies. And that text that we read showed where David was afraid, but before that it said that David was also angered and he canceled his first campaign because of it. Now, this piece of scripture in the Bible is kind of difficult to digest. Uzzah was doing something to protect the Ark. Why was he struck down dead? And we see that Uzzah had forgot one particular thing. Because if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, it was shown as a sign of disrespect. We see that in Numbers 4, where only a select group of the Levites, remember that religious class, they were actually called the Kothites, they were the only ones that were allowed to touch or to move the holy, holy instruments. But even they could not touch the Ark of the Covenant. See, the Ark was sacred. The ark was where the embodiment of God was with man. The, the ark was where God himself sat upon, and you cannot touch the ark. Mm -hmm. Because if you did, you found out what happened with Uzzah, you died. See, Uzzah had forgotten this respect and thus paid the consequences of his misunderstanding. But church, this can also translate to us today. It just means that when we come into the house of the Lord, when we stand before that holy of holies, we can't come in any kind of way. Right. You see, it's not that God is going to strike us down dead like he did us, but that breakthrough that you might have been waiting for might not be made apparent in your heart. Yeah. That manifestation of peace that when the world is crashing down around you may not appear because you didn't place God first. So that means that that mess that you've been dealing with all week shouldn't follow you in the house of prayer. Oh, See, the Bible tells me that Jesus kicked out money changers whose minds were on everything but the word. Mm -hmm. He kicked them out not only because they were changing money, because in that house there should be only reverence. Because it was called a house of prayer. Mm -hmm. In that house there should only be healing. So that's why he dis them people, and that's why he pushed out those disrespectful money changes. Mm -hmm. See, you got to get rid of that anger that you might have felt for that person that wronged you. Because when you come into this house, it's also a house of worship. Mm -hmm. Psalm 100 tells me, worship the Lord with gladness. Mm -hmm. But how can I accomplish true worship when I'm still angry? Mm -hmm. See, this is God's house. So that disagreement that I had with my brother or sister should not burden me when I come into the house of the Lord. Because yeah. when I come to seek God, I recognize that he is my burden bearer, so I should place all my problems on his shoulders. Yeah. So church, when I come into this house, I mean his house, I give God all the honor, all the praise, and all the respect that he deserves. This is what I need to do to get myself together so I truly can worship. Mm -hmm. Oh, look to your left and say, I can worship today, somebody. 
Amen, amen. So three months after the first campaign, we see that the ark is also again being brought into Jerusalem. David starts again, but this time he does it differently. How many of you know that you look to attack a problem one way and if it didn't work, maybe it's time to look to other options. Mm -hmm. You have to look to other options so you can get a true resolution. So they tell me that insanity is defined as doing the same thing and expecting different outcomes. So David knew he had to change his approach. So David lets the Ark of the Covenant be carried. And when the men of the or carrying the Ark, so this time there were no oxen. This time there were no carts. This time it was just men carrying the ark. And when the men went six paces, they sacrificed unto God. They killed the oxen and they killed the fatlings. And they also did a little things, things a little different. Because when David saw that their sacrifice was complete and the paces had been made, David danced before the Lord. See, I love how the King James says it because it said David danced with all of his might. See, he danced with everything that he had. He danced with all of his might. See, it reminds me in church when we have someone doing something good in church, you know, playing an instrument or singing a solo and how in our traditionally black churches we yell out to them. You know what we say, sing that song, girl. But put some, put some juice on that song. Do it for the Lord. See, we understand in the black church that if you allow yourself to be lost in the love that you have for our Father, that's when the Spirit comes into the church. That's when yokes start to be broken. That's when burdens start to be laid on down. So sing that song. Sing that song. So church, if the choir is singing and it starts to get good to you, if the choir starts to sing and your burdens start to get unstrapped and start to get laid down and you start to feel light, just tell them to sing that song because just like you, I want the spirit to come on in for a club. Just like you, I want to see what God can do for his people because they gave it all to him. And guess what? It inspires me to do my best to give it all to him as well. Come on, somebody. See, I believe that's why David didn't play with it. He danced before the Lord, not worried about those who saw him. But see, David's dance was symbolic in so many ways. See, first it showed us that even as a great king, he understood that there was a king who was more powerful than him. It also showed, and it was a testimony, that David's dance was transforming him and making him into something new. See, he didn't look like what he'd gone through. He didn't look like all those battles and all those struggles that it took for him to come king. He didn't look like all that loss and all that difficulty that happened on that first campaign when he was going to Jerusalem. Instead, he looked like an overcoming champion for the Lord. And it was in this truth that he celebrated. Church, it's like us when we overcome. We don't look like what we went through. No longer are we that person that's steeped down in despair. But when God has done a mighty work in our lives and we've gone through the fire and the rain, when we've gone through the muck and the mire and come out on the other end, I believe that we look a little different. We act a little different. But most importantly, we praise and worship our God differently. Because we know where he brought us from. And we know where he'll take us if we reside in him and he resides in us. See, it's funny, little church. Anytime you're doing something for God, it seems that someone always has something to say. See, that came in the form of David's wife, Mark. See, she had saw her husband dancing from a window. That when she saw him, the text tells us that she became displeased with him and almost disgusted with seeing what her husband was doing. So, yes, we understand who Michael was. Remember, she was the daughter of Saul. So there were politics that were associated with this. Remember, she had grown up in the house of a king. So she, in her mind, had preset understandings of how a ruler should conduct himself. But how dare she criticize the praise of somebody else? See, 
It sounds strange, but sometimes we fall into that Michael-like attitude. You know, why is she up there yelling and shouting? I wish she'd just sit on down. Why are they running around the church? They can still get the same message I'm getting if they just keep their seat. And why is that certain person always crying when we sing that same song? You know we're just going to sing it again next Sunday. See, church, you don't know what that person's going through. You don't know what's happening in that person's life. You don't know if that person had to fight their way to get to service. So how dare you talk about how they preach? So I do want to leave you with the thought for today. And I'm pretty sure this is what David would have told Michael. You just stop and let me pray. You just stop and let me pray. Now, church praise is defined as an expression of approval or admiration. It's something that you have aspired to for, to someone or something. Now, you know that God does not need our approval. So I like the latter definition, and that is one of admiration of God. Mm -hmm. See, church, as Christians, we adore him for who he is. Yeah. We adore him for what he has done. Yeah. We adore him for being that great provider, for loving us when we didn't love ourselves, yeah. for being the great God, Alpha and Omega. The, that's why we in churches like to praise and worship. Yeah. See, praise and worship go hand in hand. God gets adoration for us. He gets adoration for us because we know what it was when we went through that rough week. He gets adoration from us because he's helped us through that difficulty or that problem, that circumstance. But see, after that adoration, then comes the praise. See, praise, church, is the gateway of worship. See, this is how we enter into the presence of God. And this is why Psalm 135 is so true when it tells us to praise the Lord. To praise the name of the Lord and to stand in the house of the Lord and in the courts of God. Mm -hmm. See, praise is one of the tools that we as Christians can use to get to the heart of the Almighty. Yes. See, yes. praise can be seen in a song. Mm -hmm. Praise can be seen in a scripture. Praise can be seen in a reading. Praise can also be seen, of course, in a dance. Mm -hmm. Now, look at what David did. But see, no matter what you do, when you are praising God, make sure you give your all. Yeah. Man, man. Praise is individual, but it has to be heartfelt. Mm -hmm. See, we all praise God differently. We have different ways of expressing the way in which we love the Messiah. Mm -hmm. One way is not better than the other way. Mm -hmm. But no matter how you praise, no matter where you praise, mm -hmm. no matter when you praise, mm -hmm. make sure you give God everything that's inside of you. Yeah. David danced before the Lord with all his might. He gave it all to God, no matter what other people had to say. Remember, he was a king. He was their leader. He didn't care what they saw as long as his Praise was reaching, reaching the seat of the Most High. Yeah. Now, he didn't care what he was dressed like. Remember, it said that David wore a linen afar. And when we think about that, we know that linen is very fine material. So there was probably some things that he did that you could see some things that were a little unsightly. But he didn't care at that time because his sole focus was to worship God and to give him his best praise. He didn't even care how he looked. He was turning his head. He was moving his legs. He was doing everything that he could to promote to a holy God that he loved him, that he respected him, that he needed him, and whatever it was that he needed to do, he was going to do it for the Lord. Mm -hmm. So he came excited when he went into the, the, the Jerusalem. He came excited in the newness of his kingship. See, we as Christians, should take hold of that same excitement. Not looking to others for approval. Okay. Not looking to others on how to praise. Right. But instead looking to the great God of who we are praising. Amen. See, remember church, when we are praising God, we are performing for an audience of one. Mm -hmm. We're not praising because the congregation wants us to do it. Yeah. We're not praising because our family wants us to do it. 
We are praising God because we recognize the gifts that he has given to us and we sincerely want to thank him for it. Yeah. See, we must be like David and have strength enough in character to know that God is our only valuable commodity. And so we are going to give him the best of what we have and that is our praise and our worship. Yeah. See, church, he doesn't desire your riches because I know right now not many of us in here are millionaires. And if, if, even if we are, money doesn't move God. Yeah. He doesn't desire our worldly goods. What can God do with a 15 or 30 year mortgage anyway? He doesn't desire our cars because remember he is omnipresent, meaning that he is always everywhere, all at one time. He doesn't want degrees or certifications or even your businesses because God does not need any type of status symbol. All that God desires, all that he wants is your worship and your praise. Yes. See, the scripture teaches us that in Luke 19 that if we keep silent, then inanimate objects will praise him. Now, I don't want this hymnal jumping up and praising God. I don't want that mic stand jumping up and praising God. I can jump up and praise God all by myself. Amen. Yeah, yeah. So you shouldn't care what people think when they see you praise. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't care if people say that you look funny when you rocking back and forth and humming and praising God because yeah. they don't recognize that in that home you get your breakthrough. You shouldn't care about that. You just bought that brand new suit of dress and you don't feel like running around the church. I tell you, if the spirit of God hits me, I don't care what I have on, I'm going to run for Jesus. Yeah. You shouldn't care about the fact that they think that being a Christian is being an uneducated person. Because they say, how you can you believe in a God when all of these things are going on in the world? And I just tell them simply, how can you not believe in a God? Because if there were not a God, why would there not be the trees and the grass and the birds and, and all of these things in a harmony? Because if man had to do it, everything would be chaotic. See, I don't care what they say when I clap my hands. I don't care what they say when I pat my feet. I don't care what they say when I bob my head. I, I don't care what they say when I stand to my feet and give God praise. I don't care what they say when I wave my hand and say, thank you, Lord, because I know what my God has done for me. I know where my God has brought me from. And I know if I praise him, if I praise him, he'll keep me keeping on. Look what he did for King David. Look what he did for that man. See, I don't care what they say. Because the Bible teaches me in 2 Corinthians 12 and 10. Therefore, I am well content in my weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. Amen. For when I am weak, he is strong. Yeah. And I love that because I'm weak all the time. Yeah. This body can only hold so much, but I can always cast my cares on Jesus. Yeah. The one thing that I love that my father told me when I was a young boy. He said, don't worry that they're picking on you because you know what? They also picked on Jesus. Yeah. So if they picked on my master, yeah. if they did it to him, then I can adore because of him. Yeah. I can go through because he did, because of what he did for me. I can't be an overcomer. Yeah. This is what it means to not worry about people when they're looking at you praising and worshiping the most high God. Because if your worship is for real, if your worship is sincere, if your worship is coming from your innermost being like it did for King David, God is going to do a transformational thing in your life, and he will continue to bless you. Yeah. I know it because I've seen it, and I've read about it, and I know my God is not alive. Amen. Amen. Now, church, we live in an age where the world sees actions, and they think that negative actions are the gold standard. When we mention Christ or his love, we're brought up to be considered unusual or, or strange. People like to live by their own rules and not the standards that God has set before us. In this situation, it's hard for the Christian. Notice how I said for the Christian and not the church group. It's hard for the Christian to cope unless he or she is rooted and grounded in the word of God. Amen. See, the Bible gives us great and amazing stories about the way in which we as humans should interact with the Holy God. Yes, Lord. Look to the example that we had of this great king. No matter what it took, he gave it all to God, and he was not displeased in his dance. See, now I'm not telling you that you have to dance in church. 
But when you are truly praising, it's uncertain what the Spirit will cause you to do. Amen. One thing I know is that the Spirit will always get you out of your comfort zone because the more he pushes you out of that comfort zone, the more you respond to what the Holy God is doing inside of your life. Yes. Yes. So if you ever find yourself getting caught up and not reveling in the goodness of God, and yes, if you do that and then someone has something to say, simply keep doing what you do. Tell them to stop and let you get your brains on. Right. Tell them to stop and let you get your brains on. Yeah. May God bless you and may God do. There's a song that is sung and it's sung in churches. It's called Praise is What I Do. And I truly enjoy it because it just totally lets me know that praise is personal. Praise is personal because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. See, it can only be personal if I have that relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's why this part of the service is so wonderful because it allows me to establish that relationship with him or fortify that relationship with him or just have that relationship with him in another body of believers. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus wants you to come as you are. He doesn't say, go ahead and get yourself right, wash yourself off, clean yourself up. He says, come as you are. Because let him do that. Because when you try to do it, it fails. But when he does it, he cleans you up. He takes care of you. And if you happen to fall, he is there to pick you up. So that's why I love this part of the service. Because I love when someone gives their heart to Jesus. It's not that we have any power here. It's not that we have any more Jesus than any church in, in this county. But one thing we do have is love. And when you give your heart to God, we will love on yes, you so Lord. that you can develop that relationship with him yes. and be part of this wonderful family yes. we call the family of Christ. Yes. So will you please stand with me? And if you don't know Jesus as the partner of your sins, if you don't know him as the master of your destiny, get to know him today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. searching that you just continue to prick their heart God so they come to Jesus God and give their life to the one who can save their soul we pray that in Jesus mighty name amen, amen. amen. will the officers please come
being able to give these gifts. We ask that these gifts be used for the uplifting of your kingdom here in this county and in others. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Church, before we go, I just want to ask a favor of each and every one of you. As I said, August has been very unique and very unusual. And there were two requests that were brought just this week for illness and unfortunately death. Even as a healthcare provider, those are always things that are hard to explain. An illness that you know someone will not recover from, or of course death. But we can go to someone who knows it all, because he said that he would give us a comforter. Yes. So yes. if we could just come together as a family, the two families that were affected were Deacon Williams and also Daryl uh, Francis. So if we could just all come together and just pray collectively for them and with them, and just remember them in your private prayers as well. So will you please stand? Yes. Hello, God. And let us go to our Father. Mm -hmm. Father God, we come to you this afternoon because we know that you are the one that knows it all. We know that your knowledge is bigger than any knowledge that we can mm -hmm. attain or even aspire to. One thing we know, God, is that you gave us one thing when you said mm -hmm. you, when you left. You said that you would give us a comforter. Mm -hmm. And God, we just play comfort over those families that were named and for those who did not give requests. Mm -hmm. For God, you know us inside and out and you know what's going on with us, God. And you know our needs truly before mm -hmm. we even ask. But God, they need just your peace, they need your presence, and they need your love just to shadow upon them, oh God. For God, you know it all. You know what's going on, and you know how to mend fences and fix problems. So God, we go to the one who knows it all right now and just plead with you, God, to do what you do best, and that's bless. God, cover these families right now in the only way that you can, God. For God, we can definitely hug on them, God, but you can hug on them and repair what is broken. So, God, we just ask right now that you just spiritually go forth yes, to Lord. each of the names that were mentioned, oh God. And yes. please just go in their homes, God, and just be with them right now, oh God. Lord, give them just the touch that only you can give. Give them a touch that just gives them some semblance of peace in the midst of a world that seems to be crashing down. Yes. God, we don't ask this amiss, oh God, because we are a collection of believers. Yes. Knowing, God, that if we all stand together in one belief, in one accord, that things will happen, oh God. Yes. You've shown us countless times in your word, God, that when people are gathered in one accord, that that's when things start to happen. Yes. God, we saw the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, God, when people were one accord. Yes. We saw the creation of the new church, oh God, when people were on one accord, oh God. And we saw where Jesus performed miracles in towns because people were on one accord. Yes. So God, in this one accordness, we come before your throne just pleading with you right now to be in the midst of those people, oh God. Yeah. Be in their homes and be in their hearts. Okay. Bless them, God. Bless them and keep them. For we pray this in Jesus' mighty and miraculous name. Yes, and let the saints of God say amen, amen, amen. 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 and amen. 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 Just raise your hands and let us go into our benediction. To the one who can keep us from failing or falling. May his sweet peace rest and rule and abide with you and your family right now and forevermore. And let the saints of God say amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you.